Hey, again, happy Father's Day to all our dads out there. Hope we got lots of dads watching. But hey, whether you're a father, uh, a mother, you're, you're single, old, or young, I want everyone to grab a Bible, even our children today, because we're going to be in a story, famous story. Many of our kids know. If you're a student especially, I want you to grab your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 3. We're looking at a story today that many of us know, uh, and I'm so excited to preach this passage out of Daniel 3. You're going to catch it pretty quickly. You're going to say, ah, I think I I know this story, um, but let me ask you this as we begin. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, you had to stand up for your faith? I mean, like you had to stand firm in what you believe. And then I ask you, how did you do? I mean, think about it. You've had to, you know, thought you, you could enter into a conversation or I need to step up for the underdog here. I need to step in to this space. Jesus, the spirit is prompting me to make a difference. Did you respond? How did you do? I know for me, I've crumbled at times. Uh, there have been other times where I've stood strong and courageous. And today we're going to talk about how real faith steps in to that space and makes a difference. Because here's the irony. Uh, it's not until we step in to that space as kind of a, how about light in darkness, this contrasting life, that's when our testimony comes forth. That's when we point people to Jesus. We glorify God, as he said, through our good works or our, our language, what we say. We point people to him. So have you ever been persecuted for your faith? Maybe at the work, in your workplace or at school. Have you ever been put down or ostracized or pushed aside? Maybe you, 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 were, you were set aside because everybody knew that you were a follower of Jesus. Have you ever been persecuted for your faith? If not, you might not be a Christian because Jesus says that we will. He didn't say you might. We will be persecuted on account of him is how he said it. Now, Paul, who's coaching up uh, young Timothy, he said it this way. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So if you're seeking to live a godly life, count on it. It's going to happen. Now, again, we could say, well, gosh, I, that's a tough way to go. And especially in our secular culture that continues to kind of drift away from biblical truth. Uh, that's a hard way to go. And I believe it's going to get tougher and tougher. In fact, that's why we're preaching this whole series. What is it like to live as exiles in Babylon, far from Jerusalem, right? Far from a, from a Judeo-Christian worldview. We're living this life out now. And it's because we live it out that others take notice and they're brought to Jesus. But too often, what happens in our culture today, we're seeing this cultural Christianity that has so diluted the truth of the gospel that people can't see it anymore. And, and we, we're Christians, but they can't see Christ in us. Often our, our faith gets hijacked you know, by a pseudo Christian group or, or person but a real faith in, in Jesus Christ uh, reveals who he is. See, the problem in our day is that our faith often gets, gets hijacked, again, by certain ideologies. And often politics comes into play. In this election year, we're seeing this a lot. There's so much polarization, right, in our culture today. But watch, Christian, don't do it. Don't allow the world to get you polarized. And here's what I mean. It's not so much that, you know, we have people of faith who are, um, who are in politics. You know, that's not our problem. Too often we're driven by, uh, by certain worldly philosophies or perspectives or tribal groups or we've seen ethnicities or nationalities. See, the problem is not that we have Christians in, 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 po in political parties. That's not the problem. The problem is that we have allowed the parties to frame issues for us that have created a false dichotomy. And here's what I mean. We've split the gospel witness. We've split our public witness of the gospel, placing social justice on one side and then moral truth on the other. But the way of Jesus, you see, has each foot firmly planted in both truth and grace, both justice and righteousness, both, uh, both, both justice and absolute truth, the word of God. And so we stand in both. See, the way of Jesus is always the third way. And we must stand with Jesus and the way of Jesus as we live our lives. Or we'll never be a witness in the world. 
So I had one of our members this week uh, say this. He said, Jeff, if we can't stand against uh, racism, which is so much uh, at the forefront these days, if we can't stand against that, uh, we don't have, we, we don't deserve, he said, to have a place in the public square. And it's true. Uh, all of our proclaiming of what is true about the Bible or about Jesus falls on deaf ears if it's not followed by action. In fact, we know that James said it, right? He said that there, there's, there's real faith that has action. Uh, then there's this no faith at all. He said it this way in chapter 1, verse 14 of the book of James. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. It's not works that save us, but saving faith is always accompanied by works. And so it proves our belief, right? How we live and act and what we say. But look at Daniel 3. Is now we've kind of set this up. Uh, I want you to look at Daniel chapter 3. We're going to begin with, with verse 1. And what you're going to see here today is that real faith is countercultural. Real faith is counterintuitive. And real faith is, is counteractive, all right? Verse one, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. Okay, that's 90 feet, by the way, and a breadth six uh, cubits wide. Okay, so that's a strange nine feet wide, 90 feet tall. So that's an eight, nine story building. Think about that. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, this is not uncommon, by the way. This seems strange to us. This was not uncommon back in and back in this, in this period of time, in fact, even before that, some of you like me have been to Egypt. I've seen the Sphinx, this half, uh, half man, half lion that still stares over out into the desert. Um, but there are artifacts, there are archaeological finds that have been unearthed showing us that this kind of thing is not uncommon. In fact, there's a French archaeologist in fact, he was an, he, he's a, a seriologist. Okay, there, there, that's a thing. He was an expert in this era of time. Uh, his name is Joseph Opaire. And he found what he believed was the base of this particular statue right here. It would have had a large base and then it would go up. It was, it was covered in, um, in gold. Okay, it's not pure gold, but covered in gold. And it probably, scholars believe, and probably not a statue of of Nebuchadnezzar himself, but actually a statue pointing to, to Marduk, who was their primary god, a polytheistic culture here. And, and he is now going to tell everyone this thing overlaid in gold uh, to, um, to bow down. Maybe you know the story. Look at verse 2. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent uh, to gather the satraps. Now look at these people. The, prefe the prefects, the governors, the counselors, treasurers, justices, magistrates, and all the officials. Notice the details here. All the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So seven different classes of people, probably in descending order. We're going to hear about the satraps. They're like princes. They're over certain regions of this now dominated, you know, uh, empire over all kinds of different people. But we see here that, that they're all going to gather around for this dedication event, all right, and stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then there's this announcer who takes the mic, all right, if, if you will. Verse 4, he said, And the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages. See, all kinds of people, groups that were, that were now under the reign and rule of the Babylonian Empire. That when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, look at all these instruments. Trigon was like a triangular uh, guitar, really, sort of like a harp. Okay, the harp, a bagpipe, all kinds of instruments and music. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Now notice, this seems strange to us, but not so strange. This is a worship event. And we got music, they got the prelude going, they're kicking into it. Now everybody bow down as you hear the music. Then he takes another step. He says, and if you don't follow this command, there are consequences. Look at verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Here it is. Now, now you re, again, we read this. This is, this is a weird story, a fiery furnace. But again, early excavations in Babylon uh, have shown 
that this was actually a thing. There was uh, early, uh, early on in some excavations there first appeared this what looked like a kiln like for pottery. But then there was discovered a cuneiform okay, inscription that read this. This is the place of burning where men of, who blasphemed the gods of Chaldea died by fire. Again, some experts suggest that they have found the actual spot where this took place in Babylon. But at least it shows, right? At least it shows that once again, biblical history is accurate. Now look at verse seven, look what happens. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound, okay, of all the instruments there, every kind of music, all the people, languages, nations, they all fell down and worshiped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So all the people, all the conquered nations, regardless of their previously held religious beliefs, if they had any, again, polytheism was a big thing. It was only the Jews who worshiped this one singular God above all gods. It was a radical shift of monotheism. But th this begs the question here, as they hear the music, they bow down. The question I wanna pause and ask you is this, what music are you listening to? And what I mean, what, what cultural influences prompt you to worship? You see, you see, are you worshiping like everybody else in our culture? What's your ear listening to? See, telling how you should worship, whom you should worship. Is it the word of God that guides your thinking and your life of worship? Is, is it instead all that you're taking in? from social media, the news, or whatever's coming at you? Is it the music of grace and truth? Or is it the music that the world is, is throwing at you? What's giving you the downbeat for your life? Are you going with the flow? Are you truly worshiping Jesus alone? See, look what will happen if you decide not to be conformed to this world. As Paul says in Romans 12, look at verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. O king, live forever. That was kind of their, you know, coming, kissing up to him. And then you said to bow down, in verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, they pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Now, some have suggested this was a setup from the very start, that you had these Jews who were worshiping God, uh, the only God, and so they're coming after him. Now, they, they say this because uh, we see this, not only in our world today, but we see people in, in privileged places, okay, places of power who are seeking to oppress others. And we also think this could be the case because they, they're gonna do this again. We're gonna see it with Daniel specifically later in, in the story. But look at this. I want you to see, first of all, real faith is countercultural. All right, real faith doesn't go along with cultural norms. And this is so critical again in our day. I suppose it always has been. But because cultural Christianity, again, is so insidious, is so deceptive that many people think they're following after Christ, seeking him and pursuing him so they're Christians, and yet they're really not at all. At least they're not living like they are. See, real faith is in Jesus and in him alone. Real faith finds its object in the person of Jesus Christ and they worship him and him alone. Again, have you ever stood up for your faith, proclaimed your trust in Christ and has it cost you something? I, I promise you, friend, if you do, you stand up and say, that's wrong. Or in your workplace to say, that's unethical. The way of Jesus will not allow me to enter into that with my friends or do this thing. Friend, you're going to face some challenging moments if you're truly following the Lord. See, uh, have you ever stepped up knowing that others were going to disagree with you? I know I have. Uh, and I know many of us have. I've seen many of our members do this. Have you ever stood up and said, you know, because of my love for Jesus, I'm going to bring my testimony into this particular situation. I may be cast aside. I may be pushed away, maybe from family, maybe from friends. And I'm not talking about being a jerk. I'm talking about being like Jesus. And many of us today, Fathers, okay, men, women, all of us, we need to determine we're not going to bow down to cultural norms in our day. I mean, just case in point, we're not going to bow down to the cultural norms of human sexuality. 
I'm not going to be a part of sex trafficking by promoting or, or, or looking at pornography. It, it's the way of the culture. And for many, it's normal. I will not bow down to the cultural norms of sexual immorality, sex outside of marriage, whether I'm single or married. I will not bow down to the spending patterns that I see everybody else has in my circle of friends or peers, perhaps or hoarding or being selfish with the money or resources God's given me. And I see so many examples of this overflowing generosity in our church family because of what Christ has done for us. I'm going to worship a different God. Uh, you see, dads, listen, I will not bow down to the things, how about this, that will pull me away from my wife, from my children. Today is a day to commit yourself again. Lord, I will be true to those whom you have entrusted to me whom you have given me. Real faith is counter-cultural. But watch this. Real faith is counterintuitive. That is to say, it's contrary to intuition or, or even common sense. It's contrary to the ex expectation of others. That's why this, this gets tough for us. Look at verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Verse 14 and 15, he says, hey, is this true? And then he says, let me be, let me be clear. And he goes through it again. Hey, if you bow down, it's all good. If not, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. I mean, this king, if he's anything, uh, he's clear, right? Uh, tyrannical and clear. Uh, but look at this. He says, and who is the God? Look at this. Look at this uh, arrogance that he has. Who's the God who will deliver you out of my hands? As if he is God and he was worshipped as God by many emperors were back in this time. Look at verse 6. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, I love this. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. They're saying, hey, we don't need to offer a defense. Uh, this is not a proud reply, by the way. Don't miss this. But a firm reply. See, listen, sometimes you don't need to think about your answer. In fact, sometimes you don't have time to think about your answer. This is what we noted in chapter one, Daniel in, in chapter one, verse eight. It says that Daniel resolved ahead of time not to defile himself. And I see that his friends are doing the same. You see, think about it. Look, notice who's not here, right? Daniel is not here. Daniel's not in this story. Some of wonder, where is he? Well, he was, you know, he was raised up to high positions. He could have been on a, on a trip. I mean, he could be out of, out of that, that area, whatever. We don't really know. But his friends are now here taking the same posture of defiance, which is what it is to go against the flow. It's a defiant posture to say, I'm going to serve one God and I'm not going to follow the ways of the world. But I think this is where we see Daniel's courage coming into play, inspiring his friends. These are those he influenced. These are kind of his disciples, if you will. And listen, dad, you are the number one discipler in your home. This is fatherhood. This is motherhood. This is discipling others, whether you're married, single, young or old. Every day, dads are preparing their children. You're preparing your children for moments like this when you will not be around anymore. And you're, you're bringing to them courage that they're going to need, showing them what it is to stand up for what is right. Billy Graham said it this way. I love this. Courage is contagious. When a brave man stands, uh, takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened. I've seen this in recent days. I've seen my white friends. I've seen members of our church. I've seen pastors in solidarity around racism and social injustice like I've never seen in my lifetime. And it's God. His spirit is moving, raising us up. We all rise with the tide. And nowhere this, does this take place more and better than when I see dads rise up. When dads rise up, families rise up. When dad stands up, the family stands up. Stands up. You see, that's what he's called us to do. Dad, listen, you can fuel the fires, the passions that God has given to your children. You can fuel the flame of the spirit in their lives as you encourage them. Whatever that gift is that your children have received, whatever passion they have, you, dad, mom, even brothers and sisters, we can encourage each other and bring fuel to the fire. Bless them and encourage them. But, but to what? Here's what I want to ask you today. To what are you bringing fuel? You know, academic endeavors, 
Praise be to God. That's important. Sports. A lot of dads want to get behind that. Music, talents, whatever your children are into, all of those things. But what about their faith? Nothing more important than bringing courage and fanning the flames of faith in Jesus Christ. Because when you're long, look, how about when your kids are long gone? It is the Spirit of God that's with them that will never leave them nor forsake them, even though you may not be with them. We've got to play with the long view in mind. This happens mostly, Dad, listen, through observation. I mean, yes, through a million conversations, but it's more caught than taught. As, as I've, I've seen this, I've watched courage beget courage from child. I mean, from father to child, I've seen faith beget more faith and it's passed on to our children. But it must be seen in the life of the father. I've seen studies, you know, through my years of ministry as a youth minister for many years. I've seen studies even recently that show the radical difference between church attendance when it's uh, children going with mom alone. Praise God for our single moms. But when the dad leads the way, when you have a family that goes to church and dad doesn't go, the numbers are dramatic with how those children then continue on in the faith or not. I saw a recent study that, that showed this. When the mom, how about this, is the first one to become a Christian in the home, it, there's 17 percent likelihood that the rest of the family, everybody else, will follow. If the father comes to faith first, the likelihood of everyone else in the family coming along is 93%. That is a, a, a radical difference in the number and the influence. I think it shows the power of the father in the life of the family. Families in Faith, the book written by Vern Bengstrom, who's a USC research professor, the subtitle, How Religion is Passed Down Across Generations. He, say, he corroborates the, the oversized influence or importance of dads when it comes to religious uh, importance. And what he says is the closeness, he, he, the, there's a measure in this research done of the closeness of relationship the father has with the children. And you can imagine the closer the, the father is to the child, there's a 20 point gap, percentage gap in how that that child is going to follow after the father in his footsteps in regard to religious commitment, whatever that might be. And, and, and we see this over and over again. I saw it again as a, as a youth minister. I would see where where dads are active in the life of of the family, but also pursuing the Lord Jesus, the children would follow. But I also saw this. I would see when a father attended church, he was always here and yet not following Jesus every day. That, I could argue, does more damage to the children and results in what we could call cultural Christianity at best, which is often actually opposed to truly following Jesus. Because children are like, well, if, if that's what Christianity is, you just go to church, but it doesn't change your life. I don't, I don't want that. Or they, or they emulate that even worse. And, and so we end up with this, again, cultural Christianity. So I, I challenge you, dads, do your children see you not just going to church, lead the way. Uh, but do they see you actually in the word? Do they hear you talking about Jesus? Do your children see and hear you pray? See, that's where the rubber hits the road. It, 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 it's the courage that you you pass on. What kind of courage are you bringing to your children? Is it a courage of faith? Don't distort that courage either. I just would offer this. Courage doesn't mean you're the loudest, uh, most overbearing alpha male in the room. Jesus showed us as he was the most powerful man in the room. He got on his knees, washed the disciples feet. That's power. That's kingdom power. Winston Churchill said it this way. Courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. I've seen a lot of that in these days. We need to sit down and listen. We need to be humble. Then we need to act. James chapter 1 verse 19 says it better. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So then here comes then, get back to our story, the most courageous statement, one of the most courageous statements in history. Look at verse 17. If this be so, okay, if you're going to throw us in the fiery furnace, if we don't bow down, our, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. 
and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. This is a really bold statement. But then look at verse 18. But if not, even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden calf that you've set up. Even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. I call this the nevertheless of faith. Uh, God's going to come through for me. Nevertheless, if he doesn't, I will still trust in him. I think of Esther. Mordecai comes and says, you've got to speak. You've got to go to the king. And Esther determines. She says, hey, fast and pray for me. She says, because I will go before the king. And if I perish, I perish. I will do what God's called me to do. And if, if he doesn't come through, if I die, nevertheless, I will trust in him. Listen, you remain faithful to him regardless of what comes your way. The question is not what will you die for? The question is what are you living for that's worth dying for? Christ alone is worth dying for. The gospel is worth dying for. And by this kind of faith, though it doesn't make sense in our world, people see that we're committed to him. You see, because real faith is countercultural. Real faith is counterintuitive. And then finally, real faith is counteractive. Okay, counteractive. That is, it opposes or mitigates the effects of something else by contrary action. This is why our faith is a kind of militant response to evil forces. It's not kind of, it is that. It's light in the darkness. Faith is revealed in action and it brings about change. See, this is counterintuitive uh, and counteractive faith. And I'm so proud of our church family. Uh, I just want to pause for a moment just as a pastor, if I can have a humble brag. Um, and just I praise God for how we're known as a church family uh, for bringing about systemic change in our city. I mean, for decades, we've been involved serving with Brother Bills in West Dallas. Just been amazing. As even other churches have followed us through the years, we're, we're involved in bringing the gospel to our friends and uh, first through caring for those in South Dallas with uh, Pastor Chris Simmons and, and our partnership with Concord Church with, with Pastor Brian Carter. We, we, are, we are standing up for refugees and immigrants in the Vickery Meadows area inspired by and serving alongside Principal Barrios, who would say because of PCBC, uh, the, the difference in the school from going needs improvement all the way to becoming a blue ribbon uh, school. She would say she has to us as our church family. She has said it's because of you. And I praise God for what we have done. See, today in this cultural moment we find ourselves in, we are known as a church that is standing up for justice and racial equality across our city. In fact, I joined a group of pastors this week, uh, key pastors from cities all over Texas, uh, white pastors leading the way. Many of you know Dr. Joel Gregory at Truett Seminary, uh, a friend of our church. Uh, we, we came together to say, let's put together a statement and a proclamation and then see what we might do as we say, we, we are standing together. If you want to go to a Baptist church that's a part of our Texas Baptist uh, tribe or family, uh, there's no place to hide without going and hearing messages that will confront racism, that will confront oppression, that will confront uh, inequalities and injustice in our state and in our world. And so I, I praise God for our church family and all that's happening. This counteractive faith that makes change and difference and brings conviction to others and points them to Jesus. Look at verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and look at this. The expression of his face was changed. I think he went to that, you know, angry emoji uh, against Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Seven times. Uh, that seems probably an idiom, idiomatic way to say as hot as possible. Right. I mean, how can you make fire hotter than it is? But I mean, crank it up. OK, bigger, hotter. Then we see in verses 20 through 23 that he orders the strongest among them. OK, soldier types to tie them up with all their clothes on. This is interesting. Tunics, cloaks, right? Coats, hats, garments, as if they're going to wear like wearing some kind of kindling, right? So they'd be most combustible as possible. Throw them into the flame. It says they went into the middle of it or fell down into the literally fell into the middle of the fire. And the king looks in and is astonished at what he sees. 
He sees, uh, it says in verse 24, he says, hey, didn't we throw in three? He's counting three. I know who those are. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, three, three men. Verse 25, he answered them, but I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods, is how the ESV puts it. The King James says, like the son of God. Now, it can be translated either way is why we see different opinions there. But he sees another in the fire. Think about that. And he says the fourth one is like the son of God or the sons or the son of gods. Who is this? Now, remember, Nebuchadnezzar. Here's my take on this. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is a polytheist. He's simply describing what he's seeing. So he may have, probably would have said he looks like the son of gods. OK, but but the Aramaic word there can be God or gods can be plural or singular. I believe it is. I believe it is the son of God. I believe it's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ who's there. Regardless, either way you go there, what he's describing, he's saying the fourth one is divine. And I believe that it's Jesus who is in the fire. And I'll explain why I think that's the case. Look at how the king describes these men. They're unbound. They're walking around in the fire. In fact, a better translation probably they're strutting around. I like to think they're dancing. <laughs> they went inbound and now they're freed up. Right. They go into the fire. Some of us are bound today by sin and you've been tied up and you've been trying to get some deliverance. But it's not going to come. Watch this. It's not going to come unless you go into the fire. I think all of us see this in our lives. We, we go in bound and we won't come out freed up unless we go into the fire. Sometime God pulls you out of the fire. And sometimes he allows you to go into the fire. They went in bound, but they got freed up in the fire. Sometimes he, he wants us to go through the fire. Well, how, how does this happen? How, hands free, walking around, like dancing around. I mean, why, why were they not just standing there? I like to think they were celebrating. See, one reason this happened, Jesus was in the fire. See, they met him in the fire. How many of us have met Jesus in the fire. Think about that, your own story or testimony. Maybe you've met Jesus in the fire because that's where we meet him. In fact, I'd argue some of us, we don't think we need Jesus until we find ourselves in the fire. I called one of our church members this week after his granddaughter died, a dear, dear friend, precious family. I was in tears just leaving a message uh, when one of his twin grandbabies died right after... Um, she was born. And he called me back and he said, Jeff, listen, we're not grieving without hope. We praise God. Little twin sisters doing well. God has, has healed uh, our little granddaughter. He's taken her home. We have the power of God in our lives. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We are rejoicing for all that God has done in us. We have each other. We have our family. We have our church family that we've never seen more loving and more gracious. We have Jesus who's with us and gives us hope. And I mean, I was, now I'm in tears rejoicing. And I, and I told Bill, I said, man, you've lifted my heart today. And I'm so grateful that I got to talk to you, seeking to encourage you. You've encouraged me. And then he said this, Jeff, we've got to keep sharing the gospel with people who don't have this hope that we have. People ask me all the time, how do people make it through this kind of thing? You know, at a funeral or graveside. I always say they don't make it. Or how about this? Jesus has called us to prevail, to flourish through fiery trials like this, through challenging moments. Not just make it. Not just make it one day to the next, but to proclaim that Christ is enough. And it's going through the fire that we learn this kind of faith and where it's revealed. How about that? So look at this. When God shows up in the fire, even your enemies believe and proclaim him as God sometimes. Look at this in verse 26 as we close. Then Nebuchadnezzar came uh, near to the door where the burning fiery furnace was and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And then in verse 27, it says that they found no evidence of being burned and their final test was kind of the, the smell test. Like they couldn't even smell smoke on them. Hey, listen, when God does a purifying work in your life, he does it completely. 
Uh, he who started the good work in you, he's faithful to complete it. And many of us to, today would say, hey, if, you've only, if you'd only seen me before I went through the fire. See, that's where a lot of us stand today. I meet people in our church. I meet those who are believers, maybe have been Christians for a long time. And, it, and I, I can't even tell you've been through the fire. And then they tell me their story. And I'm like, wow, you don't even smell like smoke. You, you, sometimes if you could say, you don't even know what I've been through. If you had seen me through the fire, but right now you can't even see this purifying good work that God has done in me. I've been through the fire and now I live only to bring glory to him, the one who brought me through the fire. Look at verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own God. I mean, he just lays out their testimony for them. They yielded up their bodies and trusted in God instead of bowing down to anyone else. See, real faith is counteractive. Real faith is action. And watch this, it convicts others when we act out what we believe. And only then, only this kind of faith makes people stop and take notice. Listen, as I close, in this holy moment, I want to bring us to a point of, of commitment before the Lord. As the Spirit is speaking into your heart, this is a critical moment in your life. I believe this is a critical moment for many dads who are listening to me right now. Critical moment for your entire family. I, I believe this is a critical moment in our culture. Wives, uh, single, adults, young people, that we would decide right now, I'm going to yield up my body where the presence of God resides, I'm going to yield up my life rather than to bow down and serve another. I'm, I will serve God alone. I will serve the one true God, Jesus Christ, alone. And friends, we can do this because Jesus has gone through the fire on our behalf. Christ has already taken on. He yielded up his body so that we could walk with him through any fire that comes our way. He died and took on the fire of sin and death, condemnation and judgment. He took upon himself so that we could live unbound by sin, not afraid to walk with him, not afraid to be obedient. Decide that you will not bow down. Listen, will you give him your life anew today? On this day, decide along with me like Daniel's friends, we will not bow down. Our God will save us. And even if he doesn't, we will trust in him because we know him. We know of his love and his sovereign hand upon us, his power. We could join Job who said, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. What are you walking through in these days? Friends, listen, he died on the cross so you wouldn't have to face the final fire. If you've never trusted in Christ, today is your day. It's why he placed you right here to hear my voice and to listen to this truth that's coming into your heart right now. He died so you could be completely forgiven and you would give your life over to him completely and worship him and him alone. Unconditional love is crying out for unconditional faith. We will trust in him regardless of what comes our way. This is our response. See, real faith is countercultural. Real faith is counterintuitive. Real faith is counteractive as we now give our hearts completely to him. So I want us to pray together as we close. Now I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes right where you are. You may be alone, you may be with family, but everyone now just bow your head. You may even put your palms up to say, Lord, here I am. I'm giving you all that I am today and I'm receiving your grace. Friend, if you've never received Christ right now, thank him for dying on the cross for you. He took upon the punishment that should have been yours. The shame and, 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 and sin uh, that, that, that is upon you. He took it on himself so that you could be set free. Unbound. And set free to worship him and to serve him. Friend, whatever you're going through today, you can give him your life. You can trust him. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. And make me the person you've called me to be. I will live for you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, we're going to close with a special time of worship. 
But if you have made a decision and would like to talk to someone even now, you can just text the word Jesus, the name Jesus, and we'll get back to you. I want to encourage you to be strong in the Lord because listen, whatever you're going through right now, remember this week, there's another in the fire. He is with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you.